thanks to the organizers for allowing me to come. Uh, this is my first time to, to uh, Moscow and Russia, and I, I find it to be truly fascinating, and, and I had an enjoyable time. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is, um, it's a little light in here, but I think you'll see the slides. What I'm going to do today is not give you a lot of data. I hope to give you the concepts that we're working on to create the field of personalized nutrition. And you'll see this slide several times. It will t tell you where we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did science in the 20th century. Unfortunately, we still do a lot of science in the 20th century mode. Then I'm going to tell you why it's difficult to do this type of work. And then I'll give you an example of how we approach it. Not that it's the only way, but it's the way that we are developing. So every student knows this, and some are taught this. The way that we do current science is to say, let's label people with diabetes as the disease number two, and individuals who are healthy as one. Or alternatively, we could say, one is the control group, and two will be the intervention group, give them a nutraceutical, a diet. And then what we do is we place these people into some type of measuring devices. In, in this joke, it's a, a way boat. But it could be a DNA sequence machine. We can analyze their sequences. We could analyze their metabolites. We could analyze their proteins. But when you think about the data that comes from this, the results that come, the results are the average of everyone in that group. And then we compare the differences between the group. We say one group has a set of genetic markers that is higher in one group than the other. And if it's in the disease group, we say that genetic marker is involved in disease. Or if it's a protein, we use it as a biomarker for the disease or a metabolite. So what we're actually getting out is not individual markers for individual health. We're getting population level data. And this comes from two separate sets of concepts that emerged in the 1900s. The first is the design of experiments, which has, was codified by Ronald Fisher, and most statisticians will know him, the, the famous uh, Ronald Fisher. Um, and he's the one who said, essentially said, we need to randomize subjects between cases and controls. And in, those, in that era, that was very important to do because we couldn't sequence an individual. We couldn't measure their activity. We couldn't measure their uh, sleep patterns. So we needed to, to randomize and get data out. And it's been quite useful for biomedical sciences to think of averages. But we've moved beyond that now. The second concept that we still rely on is this idea of a single marker defining health, or a single drug to help us get healthy, or a single nutrient. And that came actually from Beadle and Tatum's famous experiments on Neurospora, in which they mutagenized Neurospora, and then showed that spores could be recovered, mutant spores could be recovered by growing on a single amino acid. And that paper was 1941, and they won Nobel Prizes for that. We still do reductionist type of science in nutrition and biomedicine. And yet the body is very complex, and we can't address health by just giving a child vitamin A and expecting that they're going to respond to malaria vaccines. So this concept of a single marker in population health is actually something that does work if you have a monogenic disorder. That is a single catastrophic mutation which will cause you to have a disease. And if you get that mutation, you have a 100% chance of getting the disease. And if anybody in the population has it, they also get the disease. There are about 1,500 such big mutations which cause big problems in humans, but most of us don't have these types of large mutations. This population attributable risk has a very formal definition. It says it's the proportional reduction in average disease risk in the population. It says nothing about the individual, and yet we're here talking about personalized health. So if you took that marker or that mutant out of the population, you reduce the incidence. But that doesn't happen with most um, uh, complex diseases. 
Um, there is one example or several examples of this applied to, to nutrition, and, and I won't tell you what it is. Uh, some of you may know. 70% of the world's population is uh, sensitive to this nutrient, so that's sensitive in the population. But if you look across the world's pop, uh, nations or population groups, you'll see northern Europeans have very little sensitivity to this nutrient. And Southeast Asians typically, if, if they consume a lot, will have a lot of, um, of problems. And it's gastrointestinal problems, diarrhea. And if you have too much, you actually could die. And what this is, is the lactose in milk. So there's a single allele in um, upstream of the lactase gene, which allows the gene to be transcribed and, in, and then translated into protein once you are past uh, weaning from mom. And that was a selective advantage in cold northern Europe because you had access to nutrients in the winter. However, um, there's also the same type of effect that occurred in Africa at a different location. And it had the same effect, though, is that there was access to calcium, protein, and water in the, in the cow's milk. So those two mutations rapidly spread locally and uh, produced populations that could then drink milk as adults. Now, the, 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 the fault, the reference for humans is no milk. Most mammals don't drink milk after weaning from mom. This also tells you an issue that we have. We do most of our studies in one population and then make the assumption that all of our results are going to apply to everyone in the world. And right here, these, this simple example showing that there are two different polymorphisms that alter one response says we can't keep doing that if we want to know what health is. So in a complex disorder, unlike uh, lactose intolerance or most uh, chronic diseases, you have multiple genes which contribute to the disease. And those multiple genes on average could have, and the A gene could have the biggest effect in, if you average everybody, the D gene, the, the, the least effect. But in a family or a population, the contribution of the genes could be very different in terms of their effect size. Mm -hmm. So for example, in family two here, the A gene is actually contributing only a small amount, and the, and the um, C gene is contributing the most, which differs from what's in the population. And that's because of epigenetic, I mean epistatic, that is gene-gene interactions amongst individuals. And we typically do not uh, test that. So I want to give you a hypothetical example of the single gene idea. Um, here are six individuals, A through F, and let's pretend that there are only 10 genes for diabetes, for type 2 diabetes. In reality, there are many more. So let's say that you only have three possibilities, protective, neutral, and contributor. And individual A is genetically lucky because they get all of the good alleles so that they could have ice cream, not exercise, and they would never get diabetes. Individual F is genetically unlucky. They get all of the negative alleles, and therefore, no matter what they do, they have a high uh, genetic risk factor for disease. And then most of us are in the middle. We have genes which are both contributors, neutral, as well as negative, and we have different combinations. Now, this is simply genetics. This is nothing with lifestyle. But if you look at these, there are 59,000 combinations of SNPs that you could have to give you just for these 10 genes and for these three different uh, alleles. Now, I will show you that many of us in the field still want to pretend that a single SNP will tell you what to eat or what disease markers you have or what are your uh, chances of getting uh, di uh, diabetes or other chronic disease. But here's the real issue, that every single SNP that you can measure has a very small effect size, and it's the total number of SNPs that really comes up to give you the disease or the phenotype. So here are the challenges that we have in our field. First of all, the genetic diversity. I'm sure you all know that we all emigrated, or our species emigrated from uh, Central Africa, East Africa, many uh, 200,000 years ago. And as we spread to different environments, we didn't take all of the genetic information from 
each time we went, only a subset of genes went with us. And then as we got to new environments, the environment selected us. So just like I showed you the lactose example, there are many examples of local specific um, adaptation to environments that help shape our genetics. In addition, culture, immune um, uh, problems, uh, uh, viruses, and um, uh, um, parasites also influenced us. Our culture influences us as well as uh, other environmental factors. So if you look at the world's populations right now on this uh, PCA plot, you can separate populations in each of these dots as one individual from the Hazda in Africa to the Native Amer Indians in, um, in, in Americas. And uh, Europeans are, are right about in here, so that's where most of us would be located. But each individual is genetically different from every other individual. And we could see that in this slide. Uh, it's a little bit light for this uh, auditorium. This is the genetic geographical map of, um, of Europe. It's now quite old. It's a 2007, but it illustrates the point. You can't see from, the, from where you're sitting, but there are two-letter codes in all of these dots are two-letter codes. So there's two-letter codes here for Italians, IT. There's Spaniards and there's Portuguese here. Swiss are in here. My ancestors come from Poland, PL, up here. If you did it, so my grandparents came to the US, but if you did a genetic test on me, you would know the place of birth of all four of my grandparents, because they all came from the same area, at 95% accuracy in a 400 kilometer circle. That's how precise we can be with all of our genotyping. Now, these are just mapping genotypes that differ between populations. But I am genetically unique from every person in this room, even if there were Poles in the room who actually grew up uh, two doors away from me, they could still tell us apart. So there was a group that took this type of data, and they said, I want to find the best genetic match in the population. So they did an algorithmic analysis and they said, every circle on here is one individual and there's a stick or a line con that connects to the, uh, their closest genetic match. This group in the middle, you could see, has about 170 people that you might be able to make a case control group. But if I asked you to make a case control group out of these 2,500 people, no matter how I divide up the population, I cannot put the same genetic makeup on either side of a case control group. That means every time I draw those lines, people are still going to be different on one side of the line or the other. And it's actually worse, there's no two-dimensional information on that map. So all of those little clusters that were separated, you can't really connect. Now, it's obvious, and I, you can do this experiment for yourselves during this meeting, if you looked at an individual's diet, if you looked at their activity levels, if you looked at their economic status, their social structure, their culture, everything about an individual human is unique. And yet all of the fields that you know about always insist on making a case control of humans and saying, I'm going to figure out what the culture does or what the diet does or what the genes do and, we, and we're eliminating all of that type of inter-individuality because we're putting people into groups. So the experiment you can do to test this, uh, you already know it. Just look around the room, everybody's different. Watch us eat today at the buffets. Everyone will select a different amount of food, a different type of food, or go back several times. They'll have different types of drinking. Everybody will have a unique diet, and you can just observe that every time you go to a conference. And then if you just extrapolate, you'll see that almost everything else I've told you will also be true when you start thinking about it. So for the genetics, you can look at this book called The Annual Reviews by Maynard Olson on here. So we've actually been looking in our laboratory about genetic differences in genes involved in nutrient metabolism. And I'm not going to belabor the point here, but this is a, 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 just a comparison slide. All of the 4,000 genes on here have allele differences between a pl different places in the world. And what we're now doing is data mining that to find out what are those genes 
as, as an example here, in East Asia, we see genes that differ in histidine metabolism. And so we're trying to explore how those differences will influence the uh, individuals uh, in, in their response to food. So the idea that we have in the United States, especially with the geneticists, is they say that these numbers that we're getting, this population attributable risk for genome-wide association studies, the reason that, the, that we can't really know all of the genetics for a disease is because we don't have enough people in the study. So let's say they had 1,000 people. So now there are efforts in the U.S. to go to 200,000 people per study. The assumption that those geneticists are making is that every person they add to the study is exactly like the people who have been in the study before. They have the same genetics, the same diet, the same lifestyle, the same sleeping patterns, et cetera. What they're actually doing is not increasing the signal to noise, but they're adding diversity and uh, complexity to the, in the, to the study because everybody that they add to the study is different in all of those different topics, uh, those different areas. So they're actually lowering the signal to noise by putting in additional people. So uh, Einstein was supposed to have said, although he didn't, um, doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. So um, the whole idea of the field that we're in is that you cannot ignore genotype if you're a nutritionist and you cannot ignore the, the environment if you're a geneticist. And the classic definition is there's a different effect of a genotype on disease in people with different environmental factors or exposures and a different effect of environmental exposure on disease risk in persons with different genotypes. And Darwin taught us this. Somehow we have lost this in our education so that when we become a geneticist, we forget about the environment, and when we become a nutritionist, we say genetics is too hard and so we won't study it. The other aspect of this is you, you'll have to um, start thinking that uh, a molecular biologist and a systems biologist considers the system as everything going on inside the skin. Because we can measure, you know, the DNA, we can measure the RNA, we can measure plasma metabolites, a thousand proteins, we can take tissue samples. But what goes on inside the skin is influenced by what's outside. What you eat, where you live, how cold it is, and so that the environment. And the system of the human includes that environment. And we've been very, very, very poor at measuring environmental influences on human biology because we've been essentially in silos. That is, a geneticist approaches the problem like a geneticist and ignores the diet, and a nutritionist ignores the, ignores the uh, genetic factors. So culture does matter, and this is a joke slide. And I, I, last time I showed it, people got upset because they were saying that... Um, so here's the type of food the different cultures eat. The funniest one is America, which is I'm not responsible for my health diet, uh, McDonald's, et cetera. Uh, now, it's a, it's a joke slide, but in reality, people around the world do eat differently in different food compositions we have to start measuring. So there are some successes in measuring genetics with different diets. Jose Ordovas, a friend of mine, studied a polymorphism in the ApoA1 gene and show that if you had uh, a certain genotype, if you had high fat intakes, your HDL level, which was thought to be a good marker for heart, would be elevated. But if you had a GG phenotype, then a high fat diet would lower your HDL. So there are many, many examples of this. The problem with these studies is, as I've said, a single SNP and all, a single polymorphism in the DNA and the effect size that was measured in this experiment is very small. This particular SNP plus diet explains about 1% of the total phenotype. So there are many of these, and there's a very good review paper in 2015 that shows the common alleles which have been linked to diets as well as the rare alleles. However, again, the common alleles only contribute a very tiny amount to the phenotype that's studied. 
So what do we do in our laboratories given this? We don't run from the complexity. In fact, what we say is that you should embrace the complexity of the data and then try to find ways to analyze it. So our, our idea for the experiment is we measure everything we can, both genetically as well as in the environment. We then ask how individuals are alike or different based on all of those measurements using some sort of classification algorithms. And then what we have to do is um, either go back to another population and measure everybody again if you're wealthy because we only had a few people here, or if you know why these individuals differ in biomarkers, you can do a subset analysis of those biomarkers in a second population, and then you simply ask the question whether or not you can place people into similar response groups. Now, I don't know about, I have not gone into a food store in Russia, but in America and in parts of Europe, we have loyalty cards that we go to the supermarket, and they're supposed to give us five cents off on paper towels. In reality, those loyalty cards, what they do is they monitor everything we shop for. And in one week, they could, they could know because I signed up and put my address in, in it, they know the socioeconomic class that I live based on the, on the, environment, on the uh, geographical location I am. And they start measuring what I buy to put me into a, an economic group of like-minded shoppers. Amazon does this, um, all of the online uh, sellers. Now, the first time they put me into the group, the probability that I'm in the right group is very low. But if I go back to the store every day, every week for six weeks, and I shop there, they know everything about me. They know that I'm a, I'm a single guy living alone because I don't buy any products that women would buy, or at least very few. They know I don't have a lot of parties, but when I do have a party, they know because I buy a lot more beer and wine. So almost every part of my existence when I shop at these stores is been captured. And they just use algorithms that we want to use in our work. So our analysis here is not anything unique to the big world out there of, of data. It is somewhat unique for um, biological data because what we're trying to do is combine environmental factors with also the in-the-body measurements that I told you about. So that's only part of the story. It's not enough just to measure. We also believe that you have to um, measure um, a, a change or a challenge to the system. So in 1948, the World Health Organization said that health is defined as the complete absence of any disease or physical condition or psychological condition. Uh, most of us can't do that. I mean, most of us are not quite perfect. And yet that's caused a lot of pressure on the medical community to give us drugs and nutraceuticals to make us perfect. In 2011, a group came out and said, let's not take that WHO health example because it's too hard to meet. Let's try saying that health is the ability to adapt to physical, emotional, and social challenges of life. And so this is what you can, what you can think about. The problem is that we have very few measurements for those types of challenges. Now, a group of us in Europe, uh, I was in America at the time, uh, uh, Ben Van Omen and Michael Mueller and, and, a, and a few others, Michael Gibney, thought that we should use this type of idea for metabolic challenges, that we could measure your health by how you respond to a diet or exercise and the obvious one that all physicians know is the oral glucose tolerance test in which you give a bolus of, of, uh, of glucose and you say, how do you respond to that treatment? So if you have this type of response, then you're diabetic. If you have the blue response, then you have normal, normal glucose metabolism. So we're using OGTTs and oral lipid tolerance tests and meal challenge tests to try to define physiological responses. I'm not going to show you any of those data. We have some in our own lab. There is a review article. There are 63 of these types of, 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 of studies that have been published to date. So one of the best ones that have been done is this inter-individual variability in glucose response. Now, we have somebody from that group here, so I'm not going to belabor that point. But what they did is they had continuous glucose monitoring, and they had 
uh, monitored for almost 47,000 meals in 800 people over a week to look at individual responses. And in reality, people had different glucose responses to each meal, and they were trying to put these individuals into groups just like we do. So that works for things like glucose, but what about bioactives that many of us are interested in? We've already heard the term nutraceutical or bioactive. Most chemicals in food are present in very tiny amounts, and you have to consume them for many times in order to get a physiological response. The example we have is actually micronutrients or vitamins. If you were to take a tablet of a vitamin and then say measure something, I don't know what to measure, and I don't think that the response that we would see would be good enough to make a conclusion about what the micronutrients would do. So what we do is a different design for uh, small um, molecules that are low concentration and long to act. So we did a study in Brazil in which we used um, 12 vitamins and 5 minerals, which I just showed you. We gave that to 9 to 13 year olds for 5 days a week for 6 weeks at 100% daily dose. So it was safe, but we sort of overdosed them because we gave it to them every day. So we took a baseline measurement post-intervention and then we did a washout. No control group, a, a crossover design. <clears throat> what I'm very proud of is the next thing I'll tell you, which is we did the exact same intervention in the same population in the second year. So we did the whole experiment again and what we can do then is replicate our results. It's rare if not impossible to find studies in biomedicine and nutrition in which you've actually got a replication arm built in. And I think it should be done for all future experiments. So we measure these kids in large numbers of ways. We have 26 or 27 different types of data on, the, on each kid, including where their families shop. We're trying to figure out whether they have access to food. So it was a very unique experiment because we built it as an N of 1. We want to look at each individual. We had 98% compliance on the nutrition study because we had a graduate student, one for each of the three schools, who gave the children their tablet of vitamins and the kids had to eat it in front of the students. If the kid didn't come to school, the graduate student drove to their house to make sure they took the dose that day. And the 2% we lost because we didn't ask the graduate student to go follow them on vacation. But otherwise, that's a hugely good compliance for a nutrition study. As I said, it's replicated in one year, and it's validated also because 69 kids attended both years. Now, they grew a year, and so we don't expect exact replication of all the data, but we can test for that. And then we did comprehensive omics analysis, uh, including whole exome and 5 million SNPs, 1,000 proteins in the plasma with somologic technology, and we're doing standard statistical analysis. I'm only going to show you one type of uh, data from this. We got an average glucose decrease that's statistically significant at 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, or 4 times 10 to the minus fourth in the second year. Now, the percent change is actually quite small clinically, but the results were, were, were replicated. We also found LDL decreases and total cholesterol decreases. So the population average that we could look at, which I told you I don't like, but public health people will, said that this is a good thing to do. But we also are pushing our analysis to ask how individuals respond. And what you see is that 49 uh, kids decreased glucose and then increased, but 22 went the opposite way, the way that we didn't think we want them to go. They increased glucose concentrations rather than, than decreased. And then we had two other patterns which we call down, down, and up, up. And right now we're trying to explain why those individuals respond. But the bottom line is that if you look at the population, you do not see what, how the individual responds. And so our, our analysis is focusing on why does the individual respond the way that they do. Um, we know that some of them have a very poor diet, and at least in the first year, we didn't analyze the second year data, if you have a very poor diet, 
then you respond better to the micronutrients in, in, in the measures that we're looking at. Uh, not unexpected, uh, both diets are bad, but a, a subset of the kids have really horrendous diets. Uh, we're also looking at their genetics, and this is another uh, example of the uh, inter-individual genetic variability. Each row or each column here is one child. There are 198 or so in this, um, in this figure. The red constitutes the contribution of genetic information from Africa, the Africa-specific genes. Uh, the, the tan are European, mainly Portuguese and, and Spaniards because they come from Portugal, most Brazilians. The yellow is Amer Indian, and then the blues are different uh, areas in Central America, um, uh, Northern uh, South America, as well as some from Asia. So each child is genetically different. We also have exome sequences on each kid. Each kid should have frame shift deletions and non-synonymous variants. They have nine, uh, on average, nine stop gain or, and one stop loss. Huge genetic variability when you look at the exome data. And what we're trying to do is link the exome data to the response to the nutrition. So the idea that we have in our group is that you have to have a, a, like a circle where you ask people what they eat, and we have some tools now to help do that, electronic tools um, that are being developed at Nestle. And then you actually have to get the blood levels to say, how did you respond to the foods you eat? Once we get that, we will hopefully develop targeted personalized nutrition, probably to the group level, because it's going to be very difficult to know all variables to tell an individual what to eat. But if I can put you into a group for a targeted nutrition, I'll do better than population targeting. And then we have to find out, can you go and get the foods that we tell you to eat? You and I are probably very lucky. There are two billion people in this world who don't have access to clean water and, and the right nutrients. So most of our studies are targeted to first world people and people who don't need as much help. But we have to include these other groups if we're going to help uh, in, uh, improve the nutrition around the world. So the conceptual basis is a summary slide. The conceptual basis for work is we have to account for genetic heterogeneity in our studies. It's no longer good enough to say, I put a group of Russians together and the Russians have, are genetically homogeneous and therefore I don't have to look at their genetics. That's not acceptable because it doesn't cost much money to look at genetic variability. We need extensive metabolic phenotyping. Uh, we have to do in, environmental complexity. I believe that this response to homeostasis Measuring people uh, at homeostasis is a good idea, but we get much more information when we see how you respond to exercise or diet. We want to measure, then classify. Unless there's data to classify an individual, a separate subgroup of genetics or, 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 or diet, then it's better to just do it um, unsupervised. And then uh, our group always tries, has, tries to put creating shared value in where we have translational research. We meet with the kids in Brazil in our study every time we have a, a data release, a results release. So we've met with them and their families four times in the past year to give them data about what they're eating, what their blood levels are, and how to improve their food. So that's uh, what I had to say today. And these are the, th even though it's a cool uh, area, these are the three things you can do to have a long, healthy life right now. Uh, I hope we put science behind this in the future. Thank you very much. Михаил Батин, фут. Михаил Батин, фут. Наука за продление жизни. Один из самых важных документов в области питания – это национальные рекомендации для американцев по питанию. И вот этот документ достаточно консервативный, во многом потому, что, во многом потому, что он составлен под давлением лоббистов, производителей молока, мяса и так далее. А, по, то есть он создается, по, то есть а, лоббисты давят на то, чтобы этот документ не, он не использует те знания, которыми обладают на сегодняшний день ученые. Можем ли мы что-то предпринять, чтобы повлиять на 
на, тако, на такого рода документ или на, и на подобные? Yeah. Um, we had this problem in the United States because our USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, is supposed to promote um, agriculture products, and they also are in, responsible for designing the dietary guidelines. And so you can see there's a conflict of interest there. So my view is that we have to tell the general public, who usually is, are not very scientifically astute or keep up with what we do, one message that's very clear that doesn't change. Uh, I, I grew up in a middle-class family, and they said, I don't trust any of you scientists because one day you tell me I can eat butter, and then the next day you tell me I can't eat butter because it gives me heart disease. So I don't even listen to you anymore. So we have to be more consistent with that. And also, I think, in ter the direct answer to your question is that we have to do better science that, um, that will get data that is put in context so that the policymakers will have a better basis for, for dietary recommendations. Right now, each of the studies, uh, and, and I'm sort of going to brag a little bit, instead of doing a one-year study and publishing results from, it turns out, 2013, we said we, we're going to automatically go back in and check our results by replicating the study right away. So now anything that doesn't appear in both, or results that don't appear in both years of our study, we may mention, but we will not make any scientific conclusions. So one of the ideas that we've had for many years, published actually in 2005, is that the scientific community should get together and standardize some protocols, how you do the studies, what type of data you collect, where do you put the data, how do you analyze the data, so that we can move nutrition more into the genomic community. The genomic community, and I, I'm half geneticist by training, um, has a lot of faults because they don't add diet and environment. But one of the good things they do is all of their data are released. They have wonderful databases. They have free algorithms. They hand the information away. And if you look at our nutrition community, we have very few tools to monitor nutrition intake. We have very few analytical procedures that are, are adopted in the community. And we have to overcome all of these. So part of the conference like this, I hope, is that the nutritionists and the, and the people interested in personalized nutrition will get together to start developing some standards. Our friends in Europe, uh, by uh, the NUGO group, the Nutrigenomics Organization, in Europe that uh, was a Framework 6 project, has many of these things already developed. You could borrow and improve, but we have to start improving the quality of the nutrition science that we have in order to influence these policymakers to give them better advice. Because right now, if you ask five nutritionists what you should do for, let's say, uh, how much dietary fat you should have, you might get three or four different answers. Policymakers don't know what to do either, so they have to try and come up with you know, summary conclusions. So I don't want to keep going, so if there's any other questions or...